Yes. If he runs into a difficulty in replacing the crop and gets some sort of an re emergency release or some change in his contract, he has to notify us. But as long as the number of bushels are replaced into the bin, then the contract remains the same. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sorry, the number of bu bush. Uh, one fellow out west told me once. He says it's a good thing they don't put a year date in a kernel of grain. We'd all be in trouble. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, they'll spin the roulette wheel next summer and figure that out. Yeah. Right. Right. And they're not going to guarantee reserve entry next year either, but that's all right. Yes, sir. Tell them this when you sign, when you sign up, this reserve says stock to one cent per bushel. Right. In case of a number member, if you increase the add additional seventy-five dollars. No, sir. One cent per bushel. No, sir. He becomes a limited member for the purposes of this contract only. We don't want to discourage anybody. Yes, sir. I would rather talk to you afterward because there's a, a, a whole bunch of questions I need to answer, have answered before I can advise you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. How will that affect if I get my own grain back? You know, pick is part of pickpocket. We're going to get picked. <laughs> we don't know the full details on the program, and once again, that's another one of them right hooks that we'll either have to absorb or duck or, you know, whatever. And after we uh, figure out whether that punch knocked us out or not, we'll figure out what to do with it. Yeah, that's what would you anticipate the same grain go ahead and mark me as for me, or And say once again, we have to wait until we see the details of the program. Uh, all I know is it's going to make the job of, of isolating enough grain into the reserve to force the release level a little more difficult because the CCC is increasing the, the free stocks, and I wonder why all of a sudden they need to do that. Yes, sir. The procedure is, when the national average paid for corn for five consecutive days is equal to or exceeds 315 a bushel, the secretary will release the reserve. For 1981, for 1981 right. 325 for 1982. Right. What, what do you think that's going to be like? Right. <laughs> Our intention is to pre-negotiate with buyers for the disposition of that grain. Contracts to be written to become in force upon the release announcement. That's our intention, to avoid the disaster that all of us can see if it goes by itself, right? Actually, the rule Jack gave you on the pricing for five days is a, is a little more complicated. Yeah, they take the weighted average for terminal terminal markets and then deduct what they call farmer adjustment. <laughs> One month that's 13 cents, the next month it's 11. And they establish that like the third calendar day of the first Monday following the second. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> all, all I know is this. Every morning, one of the first things we receive in our offices off of the Grain Instant News is the national average price, the five-day average, the one-day average, and it's adjusted, okay? We know where that level is every day. Matter of fact, when, when uh, wheat was released in August of 1980, 
You know, that was after the embargo, fellas. <laughs> the wheat hit release in August of 1980. I called up a state ASCS director and I said, is wheat in release status? Because our form had shown five consecutive days above the release level. And he said, no. And I said, you better check. And he called me back a short while later and he said, how did you know that? It had been released, but they hadn't even notified the state offices, let alone any farmers. We know exactly where that national average is and what those weighted prices are every day. Okay? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. The heck you couldn't. <laughs> Right. But already the ASCS office called back and said, hey, we're sorry, we just got notification it was related. Right. Grain Instant News is to the grain industry what UPI and AP are to the media. If it wasn't, you know, we have Grain Instant News, so does the trade. We know what's going on in Washington, and we oftentimes know it faster than their own notification services. Yes, sir. Is there a chance they might cap the reserve? Yes. Do I have to elaborate on that? The question was, is there a chance they may cap the reserve? The answer is yes. Yes, sir. When uh, grain goes out of condition or uh, for whatever reason, that uh, would be the request and get permission to do something else with the reserve grain. Right. Uh, by the way, the NFO, will you require a copy of the ASCS forms so that you know we're not pulling you up? Yes, you'll, you'll not have to notify us with, with some documentation or verification. That's fair. Yes, sir. Probably the most difficult and task that we've undertaken since uh, expansion of the membership in the 60s. And yes, we need everybody's help, everybody's help. Like we're suggesting that we have to leave here mobilized to make it happen. Uh, if I could offer a suggestion, what we did in our county after we secured the list was we sent a letter to every producer that was in the reserve and had meetings on one day at four different locations invited them to the meeting so they couldn't be more than 10 miles at the most from that location. And then there was four different times. What four kind of response did you get? Uh, we were disappointed. But uh, we've got our best watchers going down the road and knocking on doors. But uh, just as a suggestion, it may work better for you. What was your response to the meeting? To the meeting? I don't know. We got uh, 150,000, 200,000, something like that. Now. I mean, no, the interest is, is much better than you may think. Any further questions? Okay, Ray? For those of you that are willing, and we hope that that means every one of you, to work on the reserve drive in your area or to go outside of your area. Remember the old rule, grab the briefcase and go 25 miles and you become an expert. No. Go to a neighboring county, and we find that the exchange of growers within counties and outside of counties is excellent. We want to make sure that you leave your name and address and phone number at the grain booth tomorrow. Sometime get by the grain booth and leave your name, address, and phone number so that we can then get back to you with the contracts that you'll be needing. I think if uh, Leroy Reckner here.
Leroy, I'm going to call on you again because of a statement Leroy made this morning. Those of you from Minnesota know Leroy. He's a grain rep in the western part of the state up there. Been on staff with us operating the regular program and, of course, like the rest of the staff, has been working with members and non-members alike with the reserve program. And I think the comments he made this morning tell us all what, what the response is. Wish you'd tape that. What did I say this morning? <laughs> <laughs> so to me, it's been real surprising working on this reserve block. It, uh, men are accepting it. Last week, I went into a county that hasn't had, well, they haven't had an election of officers yet. And the first man I contacted was not a member. We got his production. The next one I saw was a member. The third one, again, was a non-member. But the key with this non-member, the third one, is people are watching what we're doing, believe it or not. And when I talked to these two brothers, they went with us on the reserve block. Primarily, that's all I'm interested in right now is reserve grain, not membership, anything else. You might kick me in the seat for that, but that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and uh, before I left, he is going to be coming. I have a satellite service center. He's going to be coming to our office. They're going to be joining, and they're going to be programming their grain. But the reason he's going to be doing it is not what I told him, but what a member that he had talked to the week before told him who has been selling all his grain through the national farmers on program marketing and was telling them the benefits he's getting using our program. This is what sold a non-member is what another member told him, not a staff man. <coughs> we had one meeting in a county in my area, Big Stone County. The grain chairman there about three weeks later made the comment to me that he got a surprise. He was uptown the other day. And a non-member came up to him and he said, uh, what's this? I hear you got a program going. You're even going to help us guys out now. <laughs> so they're looking at us and they're ready for it and they're going with it. I'm not sure just how many contacts I've made. I've had one positive no. And the sign up is running 75, 80, 85 percent somewhere in there. I'm up in wheat country. We don't have the bushels you people do in the corn area. But my goal by the April Fool's Day is to have 8 million bushels of grain in the reserve block available for sale, plus other grain, free grain, having a lot of it programmed and blocked to tie in right in with this. Uh, one of the questions that I've been expecting to hear and I haven't is what if a farmer signs this up and it hits release and he sells it on the outside. Well, I had a meeting with a banker at Breckenridge, Minnesota last week and I explained the program to him and he asked me that question and I said, it's very simple. We're taking him to court. He says, geez, I'm glad to hear that. Good for you. <laughs> and that's the way it has to be, isn't it? Right. We're done welching on deals. And I think if they find out that we mean this, it's going to mean an awful lot too. But I tell you, the reception, it's just fantastic, but I have a six county area and I don't know, I suppose I've got a hundred or a thousand to twelve hundred people to see. I've got other grain I have to service and there's no way in the world that I can get to see all those people and this is why we've got to have help from everybody in all the counties we possibly can get. Because the sooner we can get this put together, the sooner we can get something going. And like the, I wish Ray or Jack here would have commented on this a little, that we want to put a floor on the market, use the reserve price as a floor and not a ceiling. And one of the contract stipulations as we deliver this over this year after the sale is the buyer is going to have to pay us interest in storage because we're holding his grain for him, aren't we? He bought it from us at 315. And we're going to deliver it for the next 12 months so it's his grain and we're holding it for him. And by God, I think he should pay the storage and interest, don't you? So if we can put this together and get that written into a contract, the general market has got to follow. On corn with storage and interest at six cents a bushel, that's 72 cents a bushel a year. Add that to 315 and what have you got? 387, I think. Now we're getting up close to where we should be, aren't we? 
Thank you, Leroy. Question. Yes. I think we all have to remind ourselves of the dream. What's the goal of the whole program? Cost of production plus a reasonable profit. It's your program, is it right? Did I make a comment to that? You know, I've been hearing this from members in my area. They think we're the best in the United States, of course. I don't know if we are or not. But frankly, I don't care what the rest of you do. Because I know in my area, we're going to have our grain ready, and when it hits release, it's going to be sold. We're not worried about buyers taking protection, the market collapse, or anything else. Ours is going to be sold. And if the rest of you haven't done it, Billy, you're in trouble. It's that simple. That's the goal. Is it worth doing? Got two answers, yes. Um, first of all, we started the program with no discussion with any particular individual buyer because we wanted to see if, in fact, it was true that there are no secrets in the industry. We've already had some inquiries from buyers to our bargaining division saying what's going on. And our bargaining division has been under instructions to play dumb. Right? Saying, well, they're out there signing it up, but we don't know what exactly it's all about, you know, that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> but we know that they know more than they're saying they know. All right? What we're bargaining for and with is not just sheer volume, but discipline of contract performance. Now, on a normal upmarket, what is the undisciplined response of an individual grower? Hold. Now, if the market rises rapidly to the release level, what would the natural response of any grower be? Hang on, she's, she's going through the ceiling again, boys, okay? Now, that, that means that grain will either come into the market in gobs or not at all. All right, and you're a grain trader. Let's put yourself or ourselves in the trader's shoes. How often does he need that lifeblood? Every day. And a disciplined supply, then he can recontract, protect his profit, and for that, in other words, he's got several options given a guaranteed supply. So it remains attractive for any buyer to look at a significant volume disciplined for delivery over a 12 month period. That's the attraction. Because even if he drives the market back down, or the market goes back down because of, of a variety of factors, he's back in the soup again. In other words, there's the dam continues to hold grain again. The grain traders we know, and that's been public information, some of the trading houses have had to lay off a lot of merchandisers and accountants because they're not handling the grain. They built a system out there to handle millions of bushels a day. And when we put a dam behind it because of prices and, and reserve, then they have an investment that's jeopardized. Now, th unlike a grower, they can, they can literally tighten their belt to accommodate that period of time. But they would prefer not to. They would prefer to move those volumes every day of the year. So there are a variety of reasons why the buyer is attracted to that, that block. Is there anything you want to add? Yeah, I think... Just a couple of things. Uh, I love every grain buyer I ever talk to. You know, they're good people, right? 
If you don't believe that, I don't blame you. Anyway, no. <laughs> you know, they're an adversary. We sell product, and uh, they need bushels. They've consistently told us that. I never had a buyer say, sorry, I don't need any today. The Monday after Carter announced the embargo, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission shut down the exchange. We figured we were really in tough shape. And here comes a phone call from a buyer in Portland, Oregon, saying, can I buy a Unitrain from you? Of course, he wanted to take it at a 50 cent discount to his Friday's bid. The fact of the matter is, he still would have taken grain. They need bushels. Now, let's take a look at the reserve. It meets a couple of conditions that the trades always said is necessary. First of all, nobody can get it cheaper. If you're a grain buyer and you're consistently paying more than the other guy, you're going to go broke. The reserve is disciplined by price, and nobody can get it cheaper. The second condition is they have to have all the bushels they need when and where they need it. It wouldn't do us any good to have a shipload of wheat available in Houston if the buyer needed it in Portland. Okay? They got to have the grain when and where they need it. And running the elevators and running their trucks and running their barges and running their ships cuts their cost of operation. Guarantee the bushels. We won't have trouble contracting. The other side of it is no one company can allow another company to buy all of that. Think on that for a minute. We've got to keep some balance in the business. You know, the families have been at it a long time. You remember the merchants of grain, you know, they've been at it a long time. Any questions? If not, we're adjourned with a reminder that the 4 o'clock meeting is a combined meeting with livestock in room 209 and a, grow, uh, a member of the Commodity Trading Futures Commission will be there. Thank you.